Senator Kennedy, I'd like to ask you what you think of Dean Rusk's recent claim that the effect of anti-Vietnam War demonstrations in the States may actually be to prolong the war rather than to shorten it. Uh, the war is going on in Vietnam being extended in Vietnam really because of the determination of uh, those who are our adversaries, the uh, North Vietnamese, the Viet Cong, National Liberation Front. I don't think a particular action takes place, military action takes place in South Vietnam because of uh, the uh, protests uh, here in the United States. I think that even if all the protests were ended and even if all of the objections to the war uh, came to an end here in this country, that the war in Vietnam would continue. I'm sure to some extent the fact that there are some protests uh, gives some encouragement to Ho Chi Minh and to others. But I, don't, I certainly don't think that that's the reason that the war is continuing and why the casualties are going up. Well, I definitely think that the uh, uh, demonstrations are prolonging the uh, war in that they're giving the enemy, who I believe must face uh, defeat on relative ba uh, comparison of the power of the two nations. Uh, they're giving him encouragement to continue to um, hold out on the hope that uh, division here in America will bring about a peace without defeat uh, for that enemy. Many of the demonstrations now taking place in this country could not legally take place if there was a legal declaration of war. So um, we, I think, are faced with a, uh, with a choice here. But uh, again, and I'm sure the senator agrees with me, uh, America will jealously guard uh, this right of dissent because I think the greatness of our country has been based on our thinking that uh, everyone has a right even to be wrong. I'm Charles Collingwood and this is Town Meeting of the World, the latest in an occasional series of transatlantic confrontations that's been going on ever since communication satellites made them possible. With me here in the studio of the BBC in London are a group of young people, university students from the one from the United States, but uh, the rest of them from uh, Europe, Africa, and Asia. They are all attending universities in Great Britain. They have ideas, all of them, sometimes provocative ones, about the United States, its role, and its image. For the next hour, via the Atlantic Communications Satellite, they will be participating in a global dialogue with Senator Robert F. Kennedy, Democrat of New York, and Governor Ronald Reagan, Republican of California. This is another in the CBS News series, Town Meeting of the World. Tonight's subject, the image of America and the youth of the world. We'll be back in a moment. When something tastes really good, you want the taste to last longer. It does with a seven-minute cigarette. Pell-Mell Gold 100s. It's the longest length you can get in a filter cigarette with seven minutes of good, mild taste. If you've got the time, Pell-Mell's got the cigarette. The seven-minute cigarette. Pell-Mell Gold 100s. Mild taste in a longer length. Cleaning alone may not be effective against household germs that can cause odors and illness, but Lysol is. Just add a few capsful of Lysol to your cleaning water. It's the most effective way to kill household germs and the odors they cause. Prevents mold, mildew, prevents odors all around the house. Lysol even helps protect baby's crib against many disease germs. Fast, easy, most effective way to fight household germs. Prevent mold, mildew, and the odors they cause. Lysol brand disinfectant. I believe the war in Vietnam is illegal, immoral, politically unjustifiable, and economically motivated. Could either of you agree with this? Who wants to start, Senator Kennedy? I don't agree with that. Uh, I, uh, I have some reservations, as I've stated them before, about uh, some aspects of the war. But I think that the uh, United States is making every effort to try to uh, make it possible for the people of South Vietnam to determine their own destiny. I think that's all we want, uh, no matter how, uh, how we, uh, what reservations we have about the conduct of the war. I think we're all agreed uh, in the United States that uh, if the war can be settled and the people of South Vietnam can determine uh, their own destiny and determine their own future, that we want to leave South Vietnam. That's the stated uh, governmental policy, it's certainly what I would like to see, and I think that's backed by the vast majority of American people. 
the fact is that uh, the uh, insurgency against uh, that's taking place in uh, South Vietnam is being supported by North Vietnam. If both of us withdraw and let the people of South Vietnam determine and decide what they want, what kind of government they want, what kind of future they want, uh, what kind of economic system they want to establish, I think that's all we're interested in. That's all we're interested in accomplishing. So I think it's quite different than you've described it. Governor Reagan, what about you? Well, I think we're, we're very much in agreement on this, that uh, this country of ours uh, has a long history of non-aggression, but also a willingness to befriend and go to the aid of those who would uh, want to be free and determine their own destiny. Now, I think all of us are agreed that war is probably man's greatest stupidity. And I think uh, peace is the dream that lives in the heart of everyone, wherever he may be in the world. But unfortunately, unlike a family quarrel, it doesn't take uh, two to make a war. It only takes one, uh, unless the other one is prepared to surrender at the first hint of force. Uh, I do believe that our goal is the right of a people to self-determination and to not have a way of life, a government, or a system forced upon them. Mr. Regan, just five minutes ago on this program, you said every man has the right of dissent, and I believe that every man has the right to be wrong. No doubt you'd also support the American ideal of freedom. Now, following on this, I want to ask you whether in fact you would support the people who at the moment you say are dodging the draft, and whether you would go on record as supporting people who claim to be conscientious objectors as a means for not joining the war in Vietnam. Oh, now wait a minute. Uh, I thank you for giving me a chance if I left a wrong impression. Uh, we agree in this country of the right of people to be wrong. But as I said before, taking advantage of the technicality that we are not legally in a state of war, we have people doing things with which I am in great disagreement. Uh, I do not believe in those who are resisting the draft. Uh, now, we draw a line between the conscientious objector on religious grounds. With our great belief in religious freedom in our country, we have always said to those whose religion specifically prohibits them, such as our Quakers, uh, from taking human life. We offer them military service in the non-combat roles, such as being medics and so forth. And they have a great and honorable history, people of this kind of serving in our wars in that capacity. But I believe if government is to mean anything at all, that all of us have a responsibility once the action has been decided upon, and supposedly by the majority will, that we then while reserving our right to disagree, we support the collective or the unified effort uh, of the nation. Uh, otherwise, uh, all law and order and all uh, uh, government breaks down because we might have a citizen who has a conscientious objection to paying taxes. And if we allow our citizens to voluntarily quit paying taxes, government breaks down. Or obeying the law or anything else that uh, may come along. Uh, we give up certain individual freedoms in the interest of, uh, well, I suppose it comes from our own constitution, our idea that every American or every person has the right, is born with the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But my pursuit of happiness, if it comes from swinging my arm, I must stop swinging my arm just short of the end of your nose. Uh, Senator Kennedy, anything you want to add to that? Well, I expect I uh, disagree somewhat with the uh, governor. Uh, I don't think that uh, we're automatically correct or automatically right and, and morality is on our side or God is automatically on our side because we're involved in a war. Uh, I don't think that uh, the mere fact that the United States is involved in the use of force with an adversary uh, makes everything that the United States then does absolutely correct. So I, uh, the idea that we're involved in this kind of a struggle, uh, if there are those within the United States that feel that the struggle could be ended more rapidly with uh, less loss of life, uh, that the uh, terror and the uh, destruction would be less if we took a different course, then I think that they should make their views known. I don't think they're less patriotic because they feel that. In fact, I think that they would be less patriotic if they didn't uh, state their views and give their ideas. Just uh, because the, uh, the United States is involved in this kind of a conflict as we are at the present time, not to state any opposition or say that we can't state an opposition because of the... Uh, uh, the fact that we're involved in a struggle, I think, is, a, uh, is, an, is uh, an error. Uh, this is a difficult period of time, but the mere fact that we're shooting one another uh, across the world uh, doesn't make the United States automatically right. I think it should be examined. 
doesn't make uh, the course that we are following at the present time automatically right, automatically correct. And I think that those uh, who uh, have a different point of view, no matter what their point of view might be, you know, whether they are in favor in, in using increased force or in favor of uh, lessening the force, uh, or even uh, as some uh, of uh, pulling out unilaterally. I happen to disagree with that. But I think that they have a responsibility and a right to state those views, even though we're in a difficult period of time. Would you draw uh, the Mr. line at draft uh, dodging, though? Uh, I, yes, Mr. Reagan. Well, I just, uh, again, apparently, I haven't made myself clear. And, Senator, I want to make it plain this. No, as I say, we re reserve the right of dissent. But when that dissent takes the form of actions that actually aid the enemy, uh, the enemy that is engaged in killing our forces, such as uh, avoiding the draft, refusing service, uh, blocking troop uh, trains and uh, shipments of munitions, as we've had uh, uh, here in this country by some demonstrators, uh, this is going beyond the dissent that is provided in our present governmental system, whereby any American can stand up, protest, can uh, uh, convey his feelings to the legislature or to the duly uh, organized government uh, in an effort to get the government to change its course. But again, it must stop short of lending comfort and aid to an enemy uh, that is presently engaged in forceful activities against our country. Uh uh, Arshad Mahmoud of Pakistan. Um, both of you a moment ago defended the right of self-determination of people and the right of dissent. I was wondering, given the assumption that North Vietnam and South Vietnam can be brought to the conference table, would you advocate that the National Liberation Front be given a place in the, con in the negotiation or in the conference? Is that, uh, who is that directed at? Well, why don't you start, well, Senator? I've uh, said before that I'm in favor of the National Liberation Front being represented at the conference table, that they come to the conference table, that they take place, they take a part in the discussions. Uh, they have been involved in the struggle for a long period of time. I don't think that we can arrive at any meaningful peace. Uh, I don't think we can have any negotiations that really are going to be very productive unless the National Liberation Front is represented and I would therefore be in favor of the National Liberation Front, who is the political arm of those who are providing most of the troops, most of the force, most of the effort in the South, uh, being represented at the conference table. Governor? Well, here we're in disagreement. Uh, I believe if there is any negotiation involving the Viet Cong, that that is between the Viet Cong and the South Vietnamese government in a negotiation of their own because the Viet Cong is in the position of being a rebellious force, an illegal force, uh, fighting against the duly authorized government of its own nation. And to sit them down at a negotiating table between two nations, North and South Vietnam, who are engaged in a conflict, is uh, tipping the scales. I doubt if we, if we wanted to draw a parallel... Do you think the United States should be represented then? N no, if you're going to have a negotiation between North and South Vietnam... No, but if you're, have a negotiation, if you're going to have negotiations to end the war... North Vietnam, South Vietnam is going to be represented. Should the United States and the National Liberation Front be there? Well, I don't, um, th I don't think you can have a, a, a rebel force that is engaged in criminal activity uh, having the distinction of sitting at the table as, as one of the representatives. Um, I'm sorry, but you say that you believe in self-determination and that this lovely idea of let everybody decide for themselves. Yet, in, the, in Vietnam, in 1954, you refused to sign the Geneva Convention. You refused to allow um, independent elections in Vietnam. You forced the Diem regime onto the Vietnamese people. It was hated by the Vietnamese people. It put six million in forced prison camps. This was your puppet regime, and you supported it. You've refused to come to the negotiations with the Viet Cong, and, and you've shown that every time you ask for a peace talk, all you do is escalate the war. This is only one example of Vietnam. You've got the example of the CIA overthrowing the, the Jagan government. You've got the example of it giving 104 million pounds aid, military aid, to Greece. There are so many examples of America refusing to allow a people to determine for itself what government it would have. Now, I, are you talking about a people determining what government they'll have, or are you talking about a faction within a country that wants to take over and dictate the system to a country? 
Now, I disagree. Would you I disagree. About the DM regime. Would you say that the DM regime was a popular one, or was it one which you imposed on a people and which the people then rebelled against? I doubt that we could make much of a case. I challenge your history. In 1954, there was... the history of the DM regime, sir? I do, because there was a referendum taken in 1954 in which 90% of the people voted in a referendum for DM to take the position that he took. He was subsequently endorsed in two other elections uh, a few years apart in which they elected both a general assembly for his government that was preponderantly pro-DM. Uh, they re-elected him to his position. We could hardly have installed a puppet regime at a time when we had less than 700 unarmed military advisors, many of them non-commissioned officers, helping to teach the South Vietnam the means how to organize an army for protection against guerrillas in their own country. Are you, are you saying that you, you uh, approve of the activities of the DM regime? What activities? You improved that they put six million in forced prison camps and that the American advisors uh, did nothing uh, but help them in this. I challenge your history again. There is absolutely no record that six million people were put in concentration camps. They only have 16 million to begin with. Now, I'd also like to challenge something else about the so supposed evils of the, the uh, DM regime. I do approve of DM's land reform, in which he took from the great uh, Mandarin uh, holdings and began to make land available uh, to the peasants and to the people of Vietnam who had never owned land before. But also, I would like to call to your attention that a team from the United Nations was sent to Saigon, to Vietnam, to investigate the charges made against the Diem regime. They did investigate those, but as they returned to this country, Diem was assassinated, which I think was one of the great tragedies of this whole conflict. And the United Nations report, which they declined to make official because they thought, why bring anything up now that he's been killed, has, on the other hand, been published there has been public access to it, and the United Nations report completely cleared the DM regime of any of the charges that had been brought against it. Governor, let's get Senator Kennedy in on this. We haven't heard on him for a while. What about uh, your answer to Jordan's question, Senator? Well, well, why doesn't somebody ask me a question, and then I'll, I'll answer it specifically? All right. Well, can, I, I, can I ask you the well, question? Well, then? <laughs> Hands yeah. sprout up again. Go ahead, Self Jordan. Self-determination principle of which Mr. Reagan made use yeah, I, I seems to me to be violated by America's record in Vietnam, by its refusal to allow free elections, which was the suggestion of the Geneva Convention, by its supporting of... Okay, well, I understand now. I understand. I would say that uh, there are, as I've said before, I think that there were mistakes that were made over the period of the last 10 years. There were mistakes in which I was involved. Excuse me? Sorry. Do you regard it as a mistake that a million civilians have been killed? If there are million civilians have been killed, I would regard it as a mistake. Uh, I think that the civilians being killed in North Vietnam or South Vietnam, I think the terrorism that existed in North Vietnam was a mistake. I think the terrorism uh, and the killings that took place in Hungary uh, during the 1950s were, were a mistake, and I think that some of the actions of uh, President GM in South Vietnam were a mistake. I think that the United States at various times been associated with governments uh, uh, which do not represent the will and the wish and, uh, of the people, and I think that is most unfortunate. But uh, I, I don't go on this program, and I don't think Governor Reagan goes on the program with saying uh, that we've never made a mistake and that we've never erred, because I think that we have. But if we look at the present time, if I might say to you, if we look at the present time, the fact is uh, the United States is willing to uh, have elections in South Vietnam, are willing to abide by the result of those elections, willing to uh, permit an outside group to come in and supervise the elections, and it's the North Vietnamese that uh, are unwilling to accept that. Let me also say, if you want to criticize President GM, I think that at the same time, I would suggest that perhaps you could also criticize uh, uh, North Vietnam. When did they last have a free election? When did they pr uh, last have a free election in any of the countries who are adversaries? Now, I agree that our standard that we hold up to the rest of the world might be higher and might be different, and therefore we have a greater responsibility to adhere to it. And at times we have not. In our relationships with some of the countries of Latin America, 
Asia and Africa. Uh, but, uh, I'm, and I'd be glad to go into uh, what I think the explanation of that is. But I don't say that we are without fault. I don't say that even the administration uh, that I was involved with, President Kennedy, was out without fault in our policy toward Vietnam. But nor has North Vietnam. And the other important point is, which I think that you should accept and have to accept, is the fact that we are willing at the present time to abide by elections. We've stated it quite clearly. And then we're willing to permit an outside group to come in and supervise it. Can Senator I just Kennedy, make one I thing, sir. The, you, I don't know who you mean by we, but President Johnson and certainly uh, Governor Reagan isn't prepared to have realistic negotiations uh, with the Viet Cong, who you agree ought to be at the conference table. While they're spending $20 billion a year destroying the country, and while your government and your 20, party 20, refuses... It's, you're wrong, your you're, figures again. It's about $25 billion. Oh, well, <laughs> splendid. $25 billion. But I wouldn't say... 20, that, let me just say this. Let's also... This doesn't do any good for any of us to get an exaggeration. We're not spending $25 billion to destroy the country. We feel very strongly in the United States, and you can smile if you wish, but except uh, I, we listen to you. Just listen to us for a second. We, uh, we want the people of South Vietnam. Again, Governor Reagan and I have some differences, and, and I have perhaps differences with others, uh, but, uh, and, uh, but the fact is that we do agree that we will abide by the results of elections in South Vietnam. That's all we're interested in South Vietnam. The people will make their own determination. President Johnson has said publicly that he's willing to abide by the election, that even if the communists take over the country, that the United States will withdraw. Now, if the North Vietnamese, which should make a public statement now, will abide by the elections, and, uh, and we'll have elections there in 60 days, and we'll have the ICC come in and supervise the elections, then I think that, uh, and, and we then back down, then I think there's more point to your statement. But I, well, we're willing, we've held out the challenge that we're willing to abide by the election. If that's, what you, if that's where you put your emphasis. Can I think it's much more complicated. If this doesn't happen, if this doesn't happen right. in 60 days, can we take it that I'm right? Excuse me? <laughs> you said, sir, that if this doesn't happen in 60 days, there's a point to my question. No, but if the you North might... Vietnamese, will the North Vietnamese have, agree to elections? Can you deliver the North Vietnamese? Well, Senator, Kennedy, can I... to fight. Senator Kennedy, can I ask you something about these elections? Because what I understand from meeting the American press is that in the elections that have recently been held in South Vietnam, no one that the government considered in its own opinion was either a neutralist or a communist was allowed to stand. Yes, and that's right. There was also considerable intimidation. That's now, it right. seems to me that if you're, you, you accuse us of being inconsistent, if you're going to accuse North Vietnam of not holding free elections, then you should condemn the South Vietnam government that President Johnson is supporting for holding elections that are equally as farcical as anything that ever happened in any communist well, country. Let me just say this. I said at the beginning that there were uh, mistakes and uh, things done that I would uh, disagree with in South Vietnam. I'm just saying, and I don't think, and I agree your, with your criticism of the elections of South Vietnam, as I have said before. I don't think that's the point. The point is uh, uh, that we have said that we'd be willing to abide by the result of the elections. And I don't say that the elections that have been held have been free elections. You're absolutely right. The government of South Vietnam has not permitted neutralists or communists to, or people from the National Liberation Front to participate in the elections that have held in the past. But we have said the United States policy has been that if the North Vietnamese will agree to it, the National Liberation Front will agree to it, that we will agree to hold elections in which all parties will participate in South Vietnam and let the people themselves determine their own destiny. I said that I'm sure we'd be willing to do that in 60 days if you can get Mr. Ho Chi Minh and the head of the National Liberation Front to participate with us. That is, that's the challenge I'm offering to you. Mr. Graziani of Italy. Yes. I mean, I think this is very relevant. I think what we want to know is what the Americans are doing in Vietnam. I think what we want to know is what rights they have to be there. By going there, they have breached the UN Charter, the US Constitution, and the Geneva Agreements. What can you say about that? Well, I don't think they have uh, breached any of those agreements. As a matter of fact, uh, by the Geneva Agreement, two countries were created with a 17th parallel dividing them. No, no, no. Uh, a million people, a million people fled across the border to South Vietnam. Now, passage from the Geneva Agreement. The 17th parallel dividing North from South Vietnam is mere provisional military demarcation line and should not in any way be interpreted as constituting a political or territorial boundary. The introduction into Vietnam of foreign troops 
and military personnel, arms and ammunition is prohibited. Oh, well, Don't you think uh, that this is a breach? Period. Oh, Mr. Graziano, just a moment. Uh, when I said this, I'm not talking about the fact that Geneva set this up as a separate country, but once the demarcation line was set, was it not Ho Chi Minh and the North Vietnamese that closed that border after a million refugees had fled from the communist oh. regime that was imposed in North Vietnam, had fled to South yes. Vietnam? Did they not make this a country themselves? And did they not create or start the aggression with regard to South Vietnam in violation of that treaty? What about, now, let, let's, what about, let's hear Senator Kennedy on this, I, I uh, Mr. Graziani. Let, uh, let's hear Senator Kennedy on this. Uh, well, first, uh, I, I think probably I have some differences with uh, Governor Reagan regarding uh, uh, communism at the moment. Uh, uh, first, uh, I'd say... My question first. Well, I don't know. I'm sorry. Is that necessary? You should. You I'll should give me the legal right <laughs> for America to be in Vietnam. Well, I'll come around to it. I think I can answer it the way no, I No, I think you should. Hold on. <laughs> uh, I don't think that uh, communism is a uh, monolithic uh, political system at the moment. I think there are very major differences between the Soviet Union and communist China. And I think that that's recognized in the United States as I think it's recognized in Europe and recognized elsewhere around the globe. I uh, agree that I don't think that the uh, communist system wishes us well, but I think that it's recognized that, uh, that it's a different system than it was uh, 20 years ago, that we're going to make every effort within the United States our governments, uh, our people make every effort to try to reach an accommodation, particularly with the Soviet Union, that we recognize the uh, danger from uh, China, but that, uh, pr as President Johnson has said, that we're going to make every effort to try to reach an accommodation also with uh, communist China, if that's possible, perhaps out of the internal struggles that are taking place within China at the present time. Out of that might come a government uh, which, uh, with which not only the United States, but the Soviet Union and other countries around the globe uh, could deal. That's what we are hoping. Let's, uh, I will let's see I'll be glad to answer the, the question. Um, but you did not answer the question. No, I will be glad to answer the question. I'll be glad yes, to answer I, Well, I, I asked you already, what are the legal rights for I, I know, America but, to be in Vietnam? Yeah, I'm going to uh, answer that. Uh, I just say that other Tell people... Yeah, I, I'd say other people have raised points, and I think that uh, it's interesting well, that they've raised the them question. and that we're going to do discuss them. But in any case, uh, we were invited to come in in uh, 1955 uh, by the government at that time to give help and assistance. Uh, it was after, uh, in 19, during 1959 and 1960, 1961, 1962, when there were indications that North Vietnam was supporting some insurgency within the South, and it was to struggle against that insurgency that the United States uh, sent uh, greater numbers of people. Uh, we have had the same agreements in uh, Western Europe. Uh, the, uh, we sent uh, troops to uh, Western Europe and kept them there with NATO after uh, the end of the Second World War to uh, ensure that there wouldn't be an overthrowing uh, of the uh, governments of those countries and that the people themselves could um, determine and, um, their own destiny and their own future. The town meeting of the world will be back in a moment. There she goes, she's a seagull girl With a livelier, happier, younger point of view Seagull diet food works. It helps keep you slender. It's a complete 225 calorie meal for your diet plan. Rich in protein, extra big servings, many, many tasty flavors. Seago is the good tasting one that helps keep you slender, and it works. Why don't you be a Seago girl and enjoy the joy of a new slender Seago you? Seago has just made some special, very flavors that are very rich and very deep. Four special flavors in their own special cans. So very rich, very deep that you might not like them if you're not a very person. But I bet you are. Town Meeting of the World will continue after this pause for station identification.
Well, we were having a brisk argument about whether or not the National Liberation Front should be represented, and among the students, there are all sorts of hands up. Uh, Stephen Marks. Well, first of all, I'd like to ask Governor Reagan uh, how he thinks of his attitude towards legitimacy and uh, the principle of no negotiation with rebels had been applied in the 18th century. I'd like to know how he thinks his country would ever have achieved independence. I think we have to be pretty realistic about these supposed wars of liberation. The legitimate uprising of a people who uh, rose, as did the Americans a couple of hundred years ago, against what they considered a, a tyranny and invasion of rights, uh, beginning with the line in the Declaration, when in the course of human events. Uh, we must be realistic enough today to ask ourselves, are these truly wars of liberation and the uprising uh, of a people? Or are these being instigated by someone outside as a part of the great ideological conflict which still seems to be going on in the world today? Now, uh, this is what I, if the Viet Cong and the South Vietnamese uh, sit down and negotiate out whatever differences have caused the Viet Cong to rebel, uh, I think we might be surprised to discover that the Viet Cong, uh, I wouldn't be surprised, is a very uh, tiny minority uh, instigated by an outside force, namely North Vietnam. But it hardly constitutes an uprising of the people of South Vietnam. I think that it's important that the United States associate itself with with those forces within a country who are in favor not just of change for change's sake but uh, but uh, for a better life for the uh, people of these uh, nations uh, not uh, with the uh, prince in his palace or the general in his barracks but with the uh, peasant in the field and with the student and uh, with those who uh, want to lead a better life and lead their country in a better life not to turn over one tyranny uh, however for uh, another tyranny uh, not for one kind of a dictatorship, uh, to uh, the, another kind of dictatorship. Would you like to see the United States dissociating itself from the military regime, which is now in Greece? Greece. Well, I think it's unfortunate whenever a, um, a, the military takes over from a democratic system in a country. I think it's particularly unfortunate when it takes place in Europe, where the other countries look to for other countries of the world look to for some kind of guidance. And I think particularly because democracy began in Greece, began in Athens, uh, that it's uh, particularly unfortunate that it should happen there. Uh, I think the United States must make it clear that, we, uh, that our relationship with Greece is going to continue to be strained unless the uh, country returned to uh, democratic processes. And I, from one, would be in opposed to giving any military aid or assistance to Greece until it's made quite clear that the people themselves are going to determine their future, not uh, a military hunter. Do you agree with that, Governor Reagan? Well, this is a pretty cloudy situation over there, and I'm not sure that I um, agree completely that, um, well, I'm not sure that the forces that the military hunter rose up to put down were completely dedicated to Greece's welfare or whether they perhaps were again a part of this instigation of uprising and violence on the part of people who have a prior allegiance to uh, an economic and political theory uh, that they believe should dominate the world. We think that uh, communists will be all over the world because it is the real uh, very good system. You believe that uh, another system would be all over the world, but we shouldn't uh, uh, quarrel, we shouldn't uh, fight against each other, and uh, instead of saying such things as you said, we would like to negotiate, and we would like to have it in, uh, in Vietnam nowadays. And we would like to negotiate now in Vietnam, and not, uh, not to see American troops in Vietnam now. And we know that uh, over uh, 50,000 uh, people, American soldiers, are going to Vietnam. And we would think that uh, it will create a new world war, because uh, the Chinese Prime Minister said that if Americans landed in North Vietnam, they would like to send their volunteers there. And you know that the Soviet Union in the open said about that, they would like to send our volunteers too. And so it might create a new dangerous world war. And I think instead of sending American troops to Vietnam, it's better to negotiate and 
to stop this war in Vietnam and to negotiate between the Soviet Union in America and to create a very good atmosphere. Uh, this discussion is now sounding like many I've had at Oxford, many I've had uh, in Europe. It's one in which uh, discussions of Vietnam somehow degenerate into uh, polemical accusations and uh, disputations of facts, etc., etc. Uh, I think there's a basic understanding that must be had in any kind of discussion here, and that is uh, that the United States is, is not out to achieve a, a position of power uh, in land or economic force in the world. And I think that there are other things that we should uh, d debate here. Uh, when you talk about negotiations, which seem to be the main uh, advocation of everyone here, uh, well, what, so we have negotiations, and we bring the people from the uh, NLF, and we bring the people from North Vietnam, and we bring the people from South Vietnam and the United States. Well, then what do we negotiate for? Do we negotiate for a, a stable Asia? And what does a stable Asia mean? Does this mean the United States should be present in Asia? Or does it mean the United States should be absent and let revolutionary forces take their course? Uh, I think these are more, more important questions that, that could be asked. And I'm sure, uh, uh, for example, Mr. Singh from uh, India, if we uh, ask him if uh, the Chinese happen to uh, attack India, to whom would he first go for uh, help? Would he go to the Soviet Union or would he go to the United States? Uh, I th think that there are certain considerations here about stability in Asia that haven't been answered. Well, um, let's, let, let's see. Uh, I'd called on Mr. Delvac of France before. Uh, Bill has mentioned recently the uh, necessity of the presence of the eventuality of the presence of the United States in Asia. I think the best presence of any country in any other country is a diplomatic presence. And President Johnson has mentioned the necessity of, a, say, normalizing the relationship between the United States and China. Governor Reagan, do you think this uh, normalization is desirable? Well, the only objection that I've had with some of the building bridges that has been attempted by this country is very frankly, we haven't been hard-nosed enough in uh, in getting, uh, now when I say concession, I don't mean that they have to buy their way, but in getting concessions that would also help build the bridge from the other end. For example, uh, I think uh, when we signed the consular treaty uh, with the Soviet Union, I think there were things that we could have asked in return. I think it would be very admirable if the Berlin Wall, which was built in direct contravention to a treaty, if the Berlin Wall should disappear. Uh, I think this would be a step toward peace and toward self-determination for all people, if it were. And so uh, I think what you're bringing up here, and this ties in with something that Bill Bradley said, and is very significant. Among people of goodwill in the world today, there's too much of a tendency to argue challenging or suspecting the other fellow's motive, when perhaps what we're challenging is only the method that has been suggested. Uh, Let's start with the premise that all people want peace and uh, not suspect that anything that someone else suggests is a plot. For example, we don't want the Berlin Wall knocked down so it's easier to get at the throats of the East Germans. We just think that a wall that is put up to confine people and keep them within their own country instead of allowing them the freedom of world travel uh, has to be somehow wrong. I don't think you're really answering my question. I, I asked you whether you considered that, that the normalization of the relationship between the United States and China was desirable. Well, well, I thought I had. I guess maybe I was too general in that. When you say the normalization, uh, what do you mean? You mean that well, the United exactly States should... Well, you to tell me. Well, all right. Uh, the United States, will say, has wheat, and China is undergoing a great famine, and we could help with that wheat. Should we stand over here and give that wheat to the government of the Red Chinese, who incidentally have never proven that they are the choice of the Chinese people. Do you think, do you think Chiang Kai-shek is a better wait a choice? Wait a minute. Now, just a minute before uh, my young English friend smiles there aloud. Uh, what if we said, in an effort to bring friendship between the two peoples, that we be allowed to provide this wheat in such a way that we are sure that the Chinese people, those who need it, can get it, uh, at the same time that we ask in return for the Red Chinese 
uh, to sit down with an effort toward giving up some of their hostile uh, utterances which uh, openly announce their aggressive intent. Uh, is this wrong? Oh. Go Governor Reagan, you are on record as having supported the um, Senator Goldwater when he was running for president. One, one of the things he said was extremism was about extremism and, and liberty. Now, h how do you, do you see any essential difference between saying this and, and a Stokely Carmichael saying to hell with the laws of this country and those two sayings as extreme, I mean, as each, and they're both extreme. And when you talk about Red China giving up some of its hostile sayings, would you give up this saying, which is patently hostile? Well, I don't think there was anything hostile in what he said. Actually, I could have questioned whether that was the time and place to say it. He was paraphrasing a very famous remark that goes back, I guess, to Cicero. Uh, and what he was paraphrasing... <laughs> Indeed. Uh, he was paraphrasing in that statement uh, the idea of... Um, uh, all-out defense of virtue, uh, all-out defense of liberty, and that there was a, I would think that a soldier uh, who died in World War II fighting Hitlerism uh, had gone all the way out in his defense of what we believe to be uh, right and moral, virtuous, and uh, certainly in defense of freedom. Now, to turn Excuse this me, sir. Could you, could you substitute communism for virtue and you see the, the deadlock which it would produce? You think something is good, he thinks something else is good. You want him to give up some of his hostile views. You are not prepared to move back one inch from yours. May this I ask... Your good All right, wait a minute. Let me ask you one question. I could almost guess the answer, but I know what the answer is in my own heart and that of people who will really weigh this. At the end of World War II, one nation in the world had unprecedented power, had not suffered any damage to its industrial complex, had the greatest military force the world had ever seen put together, the United States. The rest of the world was war-weary. The United States also had the only bomb that had been demonstrated. We had the atomic bomb, that great weapon. Now, the United States disarmed, the United States made no effort to impose its will on the rest of the nation. Can you honestly say in your heart that had the Soviet Union been in a comparable position with that bomb, or today's Red Chinese in a position with that bomb and with that great military force, that the world would not today have been conquered by that force? Don't, don't this forget that the not. Soviet Union which fought the war is not the Soviet Union which, which is here now. And in any case, th there is no comparison, really. How can you give an answer to such a purely hypothetical no, question? No, I am saying that I'm saying this as an evidence of the proof. We're talking, uh, we America were supposed to, on this program, no, we were supposed to be talking about the image of America. And I would like to point out how consistent this was with our past, of no aggressive intent at a chance when for the first time, perhaps, in all of world's history, there was a nation with the power to have done it. You know, perhaps one day history might record that we goofed, that that was the time when the United States should have said to everyone, lay down your arms and then we'll lay down ours. Huh? Albert, we have, a, we have a representative of the Soviet Union here, Vladimir Paranosov. Uh, it what seems about to that? me that it is uh, very strange uh, to hear from you that uh, America, the only country who used uh, to have an atomic bomb and uh, didn't use it uh, against another country. It seems to me that uh, it isn't a very good idea to say so. We now have a lot of armaments. We now have a lot of people. But we are not uh, going to use this armament, these people, against America or um, against uh, in other countries. And it seems to me that uh, America, who did take part in the last war, uh, and the Soviet Union, did take part in the last war. And if we say, for example, about the America who uh, gave a lot to uh, finish the war with uh, uh, Hitler, with uh, Germany, we can speak about that uh, from, the, from uh, the Soviet point of view. But we don't uh, boast about that. It isn't necessary to do that, I think so. We'll get back to this in a moment as we continue with town meeting of the world. Now, zesty blue cheese. 
Garlic, too. Just a whisper in the first blue cheese salad dressing with an Italian accent. New Italian blue from Seven Seas. The bold blue. Creamy. So that bold new flavor clings. Unsinkable. Won't sink to the bottom of the bowl. Taste zesty blue cheese. Italian style. New Italian blue cheese dressing. Another delicious dressing from Seven Seas. Remember when the best tasting spread came from a tub? Well, it still does. Chiffon. The soft margarine with the delicious melting flavor of the expensive spread. That's because chiffon is made soft with light, delicate safflower oil. And safflower oil makes chiffon highest in polyunsaturates, lowest in saturated fat of all margarines. Chiffon, best taste that ever came out of a tub. Now, uh, the lovely blonde girl from England. Uh, I'd like to change the subject to civil rights. In England, there is a growing movement for legislation against racial discrimination. I believe that many states have experience of this legislation. Would both candidates like to comment on this and perhaps other countries may learn from America's experience? Uh, Senator Kennedy, you were Attorney General when the civil rights uh, legislation was in a crucial phase. Well, I'm not familiar with the exact kind of legislation that's being proposed uh, within uh, uh, your own country. Uh, we passed uh, some major bills in 1964, 1965, 1966, which gave some guarantees to individuals in the field of education, in the field of using public accommodations such as hotels and restaurants, and in the field of job discrimination. Uh, some of the legislation has been more effective than other parts of it. But there was an effort by the United States to try to deal with the problem, not completely successfully, but at least we made, started to make the effort. If you want to talk about some particular piece of legislation, I think it was extremely important that we pass the legislation. I think it was extremely important that we have recognized the problem and began to deal with it. But I would say to you, quite frankly, we by no means made uh, this very difficult problem that affects the United States disappear. And we're going to have a lot of problems, including uh, uh, some of the disorders that have happened in the past over the period of the last six years, we're going to continue to have those within our own country for some years to come. We're dealing with a heritage of 150 years. We've been unjust to the, uh, our minority groups, and particularly the Negroes, but as well as some other groups, the Mexican-Americans, the Indians. And uh, we've just begun to recognize it, and now we're starting to deal with it. And uh, I think we're going to have to continue to deal with it in the form of legislative action, as well as uh, personal activity on the part of all of us. Governor Reagan, uh, what do you think, uh, as a governor of a great state, of the effectiveness of American civil rights le legislation? Well, I think with all of the disorders, we've lost sight of some of the progress that has been made. There can be no question but that in this country, uh, well, I guess in all the world, there is the heritage of uh, those people who mistrust those who are different. And when you have, and history tells us, when you've had a people enslaved, uh, you have a much harder time. It is not just a racial or ethnic or religious difference. Uh, there is a, a prejudice that remains. Now, I happen to believe that the greatest part of the problem lies in the hearts of men. I think that bigotry and prejudice is probably the worst of all man's ills the hardest uh, to correct, and in addition to legislation which guarantees and enforces our Constitution, and our Constitution, and it differs from the constitutions of many of the countries represented there by the young people. Many constitutions promise their people the same things that ours does, but there's one subtle and yet very great difference. Those constitutions in many other countries say the government grants to the people these rights. And our Constitution says you are born with these rights just by virtue of being a human being, and no government can take them from you. Now, we found it necessary to legislate to make it more possible for government to exert its responsibility to guarantee those constitutional rights. At the same time, we have much more that can be done in the area of just uh, human relationship. I happen to bridge a time span in which uh, I was a a radio sports announcer for Major League Sports in our country in athletics many years ago. At that time, the great American game of baseball uh, had a rule book whose opening line was, baseball is a game for Caucasian gentlemen. And up until that time, up until World War II, there had never been a, a Negro 
play in organized major league or minor league baseball in America. And one man defied that rule, a man named Brent Rickey of one of the major league teams. And today, baseball is far better off, and our country is far better off because he destroyed that by handpicking one man and putting him on his baseball team. And the rule disappeared. Now, I don't say this is the only answer, but we must use both. And I think the people in positions like ourselves, like the senator and myself, like the president of the United States, can do a great deal of good, perhaps uh, almost as much as proper legislation, if we take the lead in saying uh, those who operate their businesses or their lives on a basis of practicing discrimination and prejudice uh, are practicing what is an evil sickness and that we would not knowingly patronize a business that did such a thing and we urge all right-thinking people to join us and not patronize that business soon we will make those who live by prejudice learn that they stand alone that they're Andrew, away our, uh, uh, excuse me governor Andrew no. Lewis our Swiss student yes. hasn't been you know, in on this all this rather irrelevant rhetoric to my mind how does um, Mr. Regan explain the fact that there is a very much higher percentage of Negro soldiers in the Vietnamese, in the American forces in Vietnam, then there is a percentage of Negroes in the States. Is it perhaps due to the fact that Negroes have more difficulty still, and will continue to have more difficulty in finding jobs in America? I don't think anyone could deny that because of this heritage of prejudice, which the Senator referred to, uh, there has been and among our minority groups, a greater percentage who did not go on uh, through our educational system, did not qualify themselves for the better jobs, and so therefore, there perhaps is a higher percentage who find the army uh, or the military uh, a suitable job and a good job uh, in the face of lack of opportunity in other lines. And uh, Kennedy, this could be about, true. Uh, that question. Senator Kennedy, what about your view? I on think that his question? point is well taken. The, uh, gentlemen, I think, from Switzerland. There are a higher degree, a higher rate of Negroes serving in uh, uh, Vietnam than the population as a whole, and the casualties in, in Vietnam uh, amongst Negroes is higher than the population as a whole. Um, I think that's uh, partially due to what he mentioned. Secondly, I think it's also the fact that the draft has been unfair here in this country and has discriminated against uh, those who were poor and those in the lower economic groups, which we're trying to remedy now. But uh, this, these are some of the problems, and we've recognized it, and we're trying to de do something about it. Some legislation was passed in the United States Senate just this past week, which will at least partially rec uh, rectify the situation. But uh, the Negroes uh, and the lower economic groups, larger percentage of them as a population as a whole, have uh, been drafted, taken into the Army, and have been serving in Vietnam, and have suffered casualties. And I think uh, that uh, I think it's most unfortunate. Senator, Governor Reagan, gentlemen and ladies of our university group, I'm afraid that our time has run out. I know you didn't get a lot of questions in that you would have liked to have done, and I suspect that the governor and the senator didn't get some answers in that they would have liked. But thank you very much for being with us on this town meeting of the world. Can we just say, say a this word? Charles to... Galling, yes, say a word. Oh, just uh, how much we've enjoyed and i'm sure governor reagan has and uh, obviously we don't agree on all of these matters but it's ex so extremely important within our own country that we have a dialogue we make major mistakes within the united states so we recognize that perhaps we don't remedy them as rapidly as you would like to see us remedy or deal with them but there are people even though uh, governor reagan and i represent different political parties and perhaps a different point of view on some of these matters we recognize the fact that we are obviously far from perfect but the world is so close together now uh, because of uh, technology, because of uh, a lot of different things, that it's so important that we have these kind of exchanges. And particularly as the world belongs to you, that uh, what we do and the decisions that we make have an effect on your lot, that you continue where you see that we make mistakes, that you continue to criticize, but that, as I said earlier, that you examine the facts, and that all of us, whether we're here in the United States or elsewhere, examine the facts and try to deal with them. Plato once said that all things are to be questioned and all things are to be examined and brought into question. There's no limit uh, set to thought. And I think that has to apply for all of us, particularly those who have the advantage of an education.
Thank you. Mr. Cowling, what is the time for just a word of farewell? Governor, I'm sh I'll let you second that. Well, I do second it. The very fact that we have uh, discussion and differences, uh, I think, brings me to the point, being the oldest one here, I can take the liberty of giving a little advice to the young people. I believe the highest aspiration of man should be individual freedom and the development of the, of the individual, that there is a sacredness to individual rights. And I would like to say to all of the young people as they pursue their way, and this has been very stimulating, I think you should weigh everything that is proposed to you, everything in the line of government and law and economic theory, everything of that kind, and weigh it on this one scale, that it should at all times not offer you some kind of sanctuary or security in exchange for your right to fly as high and as far as your own strength and ability will take you as an individual with no ceiling put on that effort. Plenty of room for a floor underneath so that no one in this world should live in degradation beneath that floor. But you reserve the right for yourself to be free. Thank you very much again. This is Town Meeting of the World. This is Charles Collingwood. Good night. Hi. Just a manicure, not my hair. Headaches back. I need more pills. Try Vanquish. Vanquish? Helps you have the short headache. Huh? It goes away and doesn't come back. It's made to bring more relief action than the usual round pills. Oh? And has something that acts on an important factor in most headache pain. Pressure on vascular nerves. Ready? Ready for anything. With Vanquish, your headache shouldn't come back. That's the short headache. What gives Tarryton the taste worth fighting for? Worth fighting for. The bright inviting fighting taste worth fighting for. Worth fighting for. Tarryton's got a charcoal tip and it's got a white one too. Together they improve that great tobacco taste for you. Us Tarryton smokers would rather fight than switch. Join the unswitchable smoke Tarryton. This has been another in the CBS News series, Town Meeting of the World. Tonight's subject was the image of America and the youth of the world.